Hello, I'm V.B. Price. I'm the editor of New Mexico Mercury. I'm here today in the Mercury Library with Democratic gubernatorial candidate Howie Morales from Silver City as part of our project to interview uh, candidates before the New Mexico primary June 3rd. Howie Morales has served in the New Mexico Senate uh, since 2008, representing Catherine, Grant, and Socorro counties, an enormous area. Um, a longtime educator and advocate for children. He holds, he holds a doctorate uh, from New Mexico State in curriculum and instruction with a focus on computer learning technologies. It's an honor and a pleasure to have you with us today in the Mercury Library. Thank you. I appreciate the opportunity to be able to be here and talk about the gubernatorial campaign, talk about state government and the possibilities for the future as we move forward on this campaign and, and beyond. In a recent release of yours, uh, you had some harsh words for the governor's state of the state message, uh, much of which you characterized as uh, lies and false promises. Could you expand a little bit on that for our audience? As we've heard, and we, we've heard for the last three years, a similar uh, state of the state address. Um, it, it was pretty much we knew what was going to be said. We knew the, the tone that it was going to come across. But, you know, after being uh, in state government and running state government for uh, for four years, um, it, it's something that's pretty uh, basic that we know that we never have had a structural deficit, for example. Uh, we have a shortfall, and we fixed that back in 2009. So that was one example of, of the things that were said that just weren't um, accurate. And so it's important that we go through and we point out the truth of what needs to be done. And, and I know that there were some harsh words, but they were uh, very accurate as well because it's important that we go through and point out all the pieces of of state government that the, the taxpayers need to be aware of could you give us a little more of an idea about the kinds of things she said and what and what weren't accurate and, and uh could you sort of round that out a little bit? Sure. As I had mentioned just uh, earlier, is um, one of the things that's been said. It was said at the National GOP convention as well that uh, she's inherited the state lar state's largest structural deficit, and that she was able to go through and and erase that without raising taxes. Well, well, there's uh, you know a lot of inaccuracies in that. Uh, we we've never had a state uh, that has a structural deficit because we have to have a balanced budget. Yeah, we have to have. Yeah, absolutely. So that's you know that that's pretty basic there. The other thing is whenever it was discussed that there was no tax is raised well when you go through and you're cutting uh, public employees your teachers your firemen correction officers and others when you're cutting their their paychecks which is what happened um, you know it's important to point out those are tax increases because that's less home that that's less take-home pay that is going there other things that were brought out yeah, yeah other things that were brought out during the the um, state of the state uh, address was the discussions on education and how the uh, many improvements that have been made with these issues that have been taking place um, and the reforms that have tried to be implemented. Well, I can tell you that the reforms that have been uh, implemented, your 8th through F grading system, your teacher evaluation systems have been complete failures. They haven't worked because they haven't uh, been able to be explained and they also haven't been able to go through and, and really have a, a way of being accurately uh, able to measure the outcome of what what educators are actually doing. So those are a couple of examples there. But to talk about the growth and what's taking place also with jobs, uh, obviously people across the state were, were well aware that those weren't true as, as well because when you heard some of the examples, Union Pacific, some of the other examples that were given, those were created well before that the governor was, was in office. She came in in 2011. We discussed those way back in 2009. So we all know that we are uh, the poorest state in the country. We know that we have enormous income inequality. We know that we have, uh, uh, next to Nevada, probably um, the most uh, stressed uh, part-time involuntary uh, workforce you know, who are working for, you know, for jobs that they don't want. Uh, we know that, uh, that many people simply cannot live up to their occupational potential because the jobs aren't there. And yet we cut taxes for corporate entities, we cut taxes for manufacturers, we, uh, and what kind of jobs are we bringing in? We also know that we're not bringing in hardly any new jobs. So what would you do uh, to improve this this situation. I've always believed that we need to work from the inside out, meaning that we need to go through and strengthen what we have within the state of New Mexico to be able to strengthen our educational needs, to be able to strengthen our, our workforce. And so I think that's something that really resonates on what we would do as far as moving forward as, as a state government and the leadership role. Um, when we talk about the tax uh, breaks, as you had mentioned, you know, it was a real concern as that was passed. I was the only Senate Finance Committee member 
who voted against that because I saw how it developed in committee. And so when you see that there's going to be a tax break, give, break given to out-of-state corporations to be able to come in and to entice them and lure them to come into the state, I saw what happened in 2009 when we hit the recession. Many of those, those companies that had some tax breaks, they packed up and they left. It was our small businesses here in the state who really uh, weathered the storm and some unfortunately didn't make it. But it's important as we go through and talk about what actually happened with that tax package, it was basically just shifted to the uh, local governments. So it's a tax increase. Uh, people at the local levels will be paying more for goods and services uh, to be able to supplement the $75 million loss that the state would have to give these t corporate uh, type of, of tax cuts. When we look and see the, the issues of the state, as you mentioned, our poverty level, we're at 49th, child well-being, we're at 50th, our educational needs are, are greater now than ever. Which companies don't want to come in and, and, and move into New Mexico? If we don't create that infrastructure and work from the inside out to make New, better, New Mexico a better place to live, we're not going to entice those companies. Yet, there's things that we can do for our small businesses. Where there's things that we can do even with our own state government with the tremendous amount of money that we've appropriated to be able to provide services, and yet those jobs are going unfilled. Those are things that we first need to look at of how we can best provide for the people across the state of, of New Mexico. We also have a lot of money that has been appropriated for capital improvements, for construction, for jobs across the state, whether it's road projects or whether it's building of, of other type of, of structures. Um, when that money is bottled up and staying at the, at the Department of Finance, we see that that's some, some areas that we could really put people to work and actually see money continue to circulate around our state. We're not seeing that take place, and that, that is a concern that we have. But we've got to be able to look beyond and see what we can do um, you know, in the future. We have many opportunities. We have our renewable energies. We have our opportunities with our wind, our solar. Those things we need to take a serious look at to see how we can go through utilize that, capture that, and move out of our 49th and 50th ranking because we have that potential. Well, I'm really concerned about all that capital improvement money being being bottled up. What's the mechanism that allows that to happen, and who's bottling it up? One of my concerns that I see there, and I brought it up many times during our, our finance committees, is that you have to have um, your, your processes in place. And with so much turnover and so much uh, exiting of expertise that we've had within our, our agencies, it really has shown that the direction that we've gone in has really hindered the process of getting this, this money uh, through. When you're having local governments who aren't getting their grant agreements, when we have this money not going through and not being executed throughout the the needed areas, then what happens basically is it just stays right there at, at the government level. It doesn't move forward and it really hinders us for opportunities of more money that can actually be leveraged that could benefit more people across the state. So when it goes, when we talk about what needs to be done, we need to make sure that we have those professionals in those roles mm -hmm. to be able to go through that competently understand how the processes could work, how to be able to go through efficiently to streamline and then still have your accountable, accountable measures in place to ensure that every taxpayer dollar is going to be used for the betterment of the New Mexico taxpayers. So are we saying that, that, um, uh, that the people that the governor has put in office in, in those areas are incompetent or are they consciously or even by policy holding that money back? I think as we go through and we talk about um, those uh, level of expertise that we've had, um, when there's changes that are made, some by political, uh, for political reasons, some for other reasons, and you lose that expertise and that institutional knowledge that has been there, mm -hmm. what you do lose is you lose that, that proficiency of how to be able to best maneuver uh, state tax dollars. And so it is a concern when we see that, but it's not only with the Department of Finance that we see that there's a real hold on, on many of our uh, dollars. We see that in other agencies. You know, we hear this with CYFD, how we've had some issues that have taken place with, you know, unfortunately, children that have died, yes. children that didn't get the, the needed assistance that, that the state should be providing for. And instead, what happens is the agency turns back and gives nearly $7 million that could actually be used for, one, to put people to work, two, to make sure those services are provided, and most importantly, to make sure that we're protecting those that are depending on us. You look at what happened in the Department of Health, and I, and I work extremely hard on uh, issues that involve people with disabilities, and we have appropriate money to get people off of the DD waiver, meaning that these services that could be provided for our most severely impacted uh, disabled individuals, and you turn back $2 million at that point, 
that's a huge concern because these dollars are not working for the people of the yeah. state of New Mexico, yet they've been appropriated. That's been part of the balanced budget, and they're not being uh, appropriated. So where those dollars go is they go right back to the general fund. And and those are not the intent of, of the legislature and the intent of what the taxpayers expect. We want that money to work for the people of the state of New Mexico. But it even goes further. When you look and see what has happened, when we've had a miscommunication, when our public education department hasn't communicated with the legislature and sharing that the federal government is, is concerned about our dollars that we spend in a special ed um, population, and we have to turn back and pay nearly $24 million um, because we didn't meet our maintenance of effort agreement, those are, again, those are losses to our taxpayers. When we go through and we're not uh, efficiently and stringently abiding by the maintenance uh, or the memorandum of, of understanding and the master settlement agreement on our tobacco fund, that's another 20 some million dollars that we go through and we lose in the state of New Mexico that can go through and assist with early childhood education, go through and assist with even our lottery scholarship, which we really depended on that money to help with that solvency of that of that uh, area. So it, it extends far beyond just one agency. This is a consistent pattern that we're seeing throughout state government, and it's not working. So it sounds like we have a kind of a, 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 a policy structure coming out of the of the executive branch uh, that is almost telling people not to not spend the money that they have have to be able to spend. Um, is that is that accurate? I think that the intent is to go through and to spend the dollars that are appropriated because it's it is a part of the balanced budget. But I think that the inefficiencies and the ability to know how to how to uh, effectively get those monies administered to either the local levels or to the agencies at the local levels, that's where I think that we're really having a, a real hang up. Yeah. And it's unfortunate because um, I believe that we want to get those services out there. But then you have another issue that you're being discussed is there want to be there's you know want the idea to have a limit of of government spending, and so you want to shrink government as many times as the mantra of this administration and. Yeah and of, of many individuals across the country. But what actually is happening in the state of New Mexico is that we're not necessarily shrinking um, government spending because we've already appropriated that. What we're shrinking is the government services to the people who need it the most, whether the senior citizens, whether they're veteran services, uh, services for individuals with disabilities, or in our educational communities, uh, just as I shared earlier with our, with our children who really need that protection, that's what we're shrinking. It's that we're shrinking those services that that the people of New Mexico really want to make sure that we have in place for all New Mexicans. Yeah, that's a very important point, um, and it's um, it's a shocking and and heartbreaking thing to hear. Uh, you get sort of whiffs of that around, but 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 you put that together very nicely in a in a whole package. So let me move to to another area, uh, to an area of your deepest expertise, I believe, which is education. Um, what, one, what, do we need education reform in New Mexico? Two, is the approach of the governor uh, and, and these national Republican think tanks and other things are taking, is it the way we need to go? And if it's not the way we need to go, what is the way? Well, definitely we know education is important. It's basically the, the tie to economic development, to jobs, to the economy, to the future of the state of New Mexico. So we know that that's important and it is very near and dear to me. When we go through and talk about the issues that are dealing within the state of New Mexico, I don't believe that education needs to be reformed. I believe it needs to be transformed. I don't think that we need to go through and we need to um, focus on standardizing education. I think we need to individualize it. And so being in the classroom, being a former teacher, uh, studying the issues is something that is really important to me, which I've been arguing since 2011 when the Florida reform model came into the state of New Mexico. Yeah. I shared uh, what areas were not going to work. I tried to work together in a bipartisan way and passing pieces of legislation that would have really fixed a lot of the issues that we're dealing with, and they get vetoed. And, you know, when you're working in that way and you have the knowledge and the expertise and willing to share that for the betterment of New Mexicans, I believe that we need to be able to come together to be able to do what we need to do for the citizens and for our students across the state. But as we go through and talk about education, obviously funding is going to be key. When so much money that we've appropriated over the last couple of years has gone to the public education department rather than going into the services of the students in the state of New Mexico, there's a you know there's some some inequalities that take place right there. We need those dollars to be able to go through to the educational experts 
who really know what to do. Instead, what we're doing is we're sending many of those dollars that go to the public education department to testing companies, to textbook companies, to companies and consultants all across the country that are really capitalizing as part of this national network that goes through and trying to reform on the basis of crisis. So when they go through and try to just show how terribly uh, bad our students are doing, they're not giving the full picture and they're not giving the full credit to our educators who are working day in and day out. Obviously, there's room that we can improve. Obviously, we need to improve. But when we go through and we're putting a crisis out there uh, to be able to pass what I believe are our monetary reasons uh, for reforms, we're really doing an injustice to our students. Do I, what other areas do I think that we can move forward on? There's many things that we can do. As I shared, individualizing our educational component is going to be key. When I got into teaching, I got into teaching to be uh, the creativity the part that would be able to stimulate both parts of the brain, your critical thinking side, your math, your reading, which is extremely important, but you also have your, your right side of the brain, that's your creativity, your dance, your music, your arts, all those parts stimulate each of the brain, yet we're narrowing the curriculum where we're forcing students to basically just go through and become test takers uh, and, and in many ways getting them prepared for a work life that uh, is going to be basically uh, a drill and kill type of approach and so I you know I go through and, and really stand strong and you know and I'm not the only one who, who's in this to be endorsed by an individual by uh, like Diane Ravitch who's a national leader well-respected individual throughout the country because she stood up to these reforms she stood up and seen the harm when she was actually part of an individual who, who um, saw the effects firsthand that really tells you that the state of New Mexico is going to be on the national scene because we have an opportunity to really make a change for the educational portion of our of our state and move us into a direction that we can develop in our system that is our very own and that we can be proud of and not a cookie cutter approach that's done in other states. I've been lucky enough uh, to have been teaching off and on for probably the last 40 years in the university level and I see a lot of a lot of very good students from New Mexico schools. Um, and I've always wondered, I guess my wonder is, 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 has this Florida model created a crisis to solve in order to make money for somebody outside of the state? It seems to me that your emphasis on transformation rather than reform is really, it's a very important distinction. Reform implies something deeply, almost congenitally broken. And I don't, th I've never seen that in our school system. I mean, sure, they're good students and bad students. I mean, or are everywhere, but there's also a deep, deep commitment on the part of a, of a whole part of our, of our teacherly uh, world, you know, to do their job well. So I guess, I guess, are we, are they creating a crisis to solve, to make somebody else rich, and in the process wrecking our kids? So basically, the crisis that's being created, and again, New Mexico is not the first state that's experienced this. That's what's really helped me in my arguments and my, my defense of what needs to be done in, in the state of New Mexico with education. I simply just have, have researched it. I simply have studied what has taken place in other states um, and how those areas didn't work. But it's easy to go through when you can create this crisis that this educational system is so broken that we need to go through and implement all these changes. I don't want to go through and implement something. I want to implement the right thing and what needs to be done for the students of the state of New Mexico. We're a diverse uh, state. We're a state that has many uh, different areas that we can capitalize on and we need to improve on. But as we go through and we continue to ship dollars outside of the state of New Mexico, for profit and you see this in many of these areas that are starting to pop up whether they're online educational uh, opportunities that take from our our school districts and our schools and yet they're uh, for profit generated those are things that are going to continue to happen and that's why the change needs to happen because when we talk about transformation we're based on an educational model that was developed years and years ago an institution that would bring students into a classroom and try to educate them we're a diverse world now. We need to make sure that we go through and we individualize that education opportunity for the student, regardless of what it is they want to do. We're going to have our physicians. We're going to have our engineers. We're going to go through and have our students who do extremely well, whether the technology uh, and, and the scientific components. So those things are great. But we also need to go through and value and nurture those students who want to go into the trades, maybe want to do the carpentry, the, the plumbing, the auto mechanics, um, all those type of, of careers we need to make sure that we foster and we find that uh, interest of the students because that would, that's what we go through and we develop as a society um, of how we're able to go through and benefit 
from one another because we can definitely go through and educate students in one way to prepare them to go into the university setting. But the reality of it, not all students are going to go in the university setting. How can we best prepare those students to be productive, lifelong citizens in our global economy? So let me ask you some questions about uh, transparency in government. Uh, we've heard, and I guess there's solid evidence that uh, parts of the uh, Martinez administration were trying to run the state's business, the public's business, by private emails. We've we've seen um, what I consider to be a, a, a travesty of justice with with the behavioral health situation, in which uh, all kinds of good, hardworking, uh, solid people have been accused of you know, really felonies uh, and have had no chance to defend themselves. We've seen um, uh, very questionable matters in terms of uh, 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 the Restino at the Downs in Albuquerque and who gets what and who was, uh, who was on the pipeline to the office up, up in Santa Fe and, and who wasn't. So I'm wondering um, how you would approach the issue of transparency. And two, I'd love to hear your views, particularly on behavioral health in the Racino. We'll go through and talk about transparency. That was another piece that I had mentioned in a state of the state uh, rebuttal, um, simply because this administration, they got elected on one of the basis that they were going to be the most transparent uh, government and administration that New Mexico has ever had. We know that's not the case. We know that there's a lot of concerns and a lot of questions that have happened. And I wanted to make sure and call the governor out on that because the people of the state of New Mexico need to be able to trust their government. They need to make sure that what we're doing is going to be for the best in the interest of every New Mexican. So when that has happened and, and you look at the issues that have taken place, for instance, at the Racino, yeah, there's a lot of question marks that have taken place. You have a political consultant who has definitely had a role in the decisions that are made with uh, with uh, state government. And, you know, when you go through and you have a spouse that goes on a, on a hunting trip uh, with the people who, who ultimately gets the the uh, Racino contract, those things really bring a lot of question and a lot of concern to the people across the state of New Mexico. And it's our job as, as legislators and, and critical thinkers throughout the state to question these things and to make sure that we go through and we're not going to tolerate that. And, and I think those are things that, um, you know, we're hearing more and more that we want to make sure that we address those. When we talk about uh, the behavioral health side of it and we talk what's taking place there, you know, my, my wife being a, a psychiatrist, um, when the governor and the secretary of health and human services will stand up and say that there are no services that are interrupted, I can tell by the volume of phone calls that my wife gets that people are going into the emergency rooms for their medication and for the services that they were not getting uh, because these behavioral health systems were changed. Yeah. So those are things that I really bring out mm -hmm. and we talk about what takes place. Again, it's taxpayer dollars that need to be working for the benefit of taxpayers and people who need those services. But here we go and there's um, these deals that are made and the timeline that shows that audits were um, already in place and the people who were gonna do the audits, for example, going to Arizona before even the audits took place to recruit companies to come in and on top of that, we give $17 million bonus to start up their companies while we take out these providers and these jobs within the state of New Mexico. There's a lot of concern when we talk about transparency there. And as far as going through, you know, it, it's pretty simple as we go through and how we're going to be able to, to operate a government. We're basically going to go through and just to make sure that the public is aware of what's taking place so that they know that there are no backroom deals that are going to take place, that they know that there are no shady uh, discussions that are going to leave the public out of it because it's the public who funds us. It's the public who operates the, the business of state. And uh, and it's important that we do bring that, those things out. You had mentioned the issue as far as on, on private emails that have taken place. We saw just uh, recently in the Albuquerque Journal some of the discussions that have, have taken place and whether there were text messages or emails you know it's important that we do bring that out as well and to be able to provide that information uh, when when needed I know personally um, you know I've gone through and I've and I've been asked for uh, inspection of public records and it was done in retaliation to my question as to wanting to see how state government is being uh, interfered and being uh, worked from from a political perspective and so the retaliation came in and asked me for my my private emails um, because the technology was not where it needed to be back in 2008 it was much easier to go through and use my private emails 
I complied with the inspection of public records. I gave the information with respect that I wanted to make sure that my constituents were protected because there's some safety reasons. There's some issues there that are confidential. Mm -hmm. And so those things we always want to make sure and protect the, the those constituents when they come to us as legislators as concerns. But as we go through and we talk about what needs to be done, it's pretty simple. I think that it's pretty simple. We've learned that at a young age of how we can go through to make sure that we're transparent and how we're going to make sure and bring that trust back to the state of New Mexico that every single person knows that their taxpayer dollars are going to be used for their benefit. Well, obviously, uh, you're a legislator. You are not part of the executive branch. You have to deal with your constituents however you can deal with them. It's a far cry for you uh, using emails to deal with your constituents than it is for the executive branch to deal with its, with its hirelings and its operatives uh, through private emails. I mean, it's a totally different situation in my mind. Let me ask you a little bit about uh, gun violence in schools and this awful situation in Roswell and other things. We know that it's not just Roswell that has problems with uh, with gun violence. We're, we've been very uh, we've been very lucky so far. I think that we haven't had any any really awful things here except for that uh, so far. But what do you? What do we do in a society like ours, which is awash with some 300 million uh, guns? And, and um, uh, do we arm teachers? Do we have... I mean, there's been some crazy ideas that, that have been uh, 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 spoken of. And, I'm, and I, I'm aware that there are probably three or four bills uh, in the House, I think, and in the Senate, too, here now that are that are proposing uh, uh, some rational ideas and some not so rational ideas about gun control. Uh, could you talk a little bit about that and, and, uh, and give our audience a view of your, of your feelings? You know, in the issue of gun control and the gun discussions that are taking place, and I haven't seen, personally seen the legislation that's been introduced uh, this session in the legislature, but, you know, I was in Roswell last week. It took I was there on Thursday meeting with the educators, meeting with business people and just general uh, people from the from the public. Um, we had this visit scheduled, and we, we, we thought, do we go down there and do this visit? They wanted us to come in. They wanted to be able to discuss some of these issues, so our heart goes out to every individual there in Roswell and to all the, the individuals who were affected um, because it is definitely a tragedy. Um, you know, I, I remember right next door to my, my home in Silver City, we had a student who was killed in Deming and when that happened in Deming, oh, that's right. so I, I see the, the impact that it has on a community. You know, we talk about the issues of, of what we need to do for, for the issues with guns. I come from a very diverse type of, of um, area where I have many hunters. I have many sportsmen who want to make sure that they have the opportunity to do that. And, uh, and I also have individuals who are very concerned about the availability of, of firearms. Um, so I go and I see it from all different perspectives. Um, you know, in any discussions that we've had and you have the, the fear that says that don't take my guns away, don't take my constitutional rights away. Well, I, I really don't see the, the logic in that because I haven't seen any discussions that were going to take people's guns away. There was just going to be some responsibility and some, some ownership as far as on uh, what needs to be done to make sure that there is safety there. So I, as we go forward, I want to make sure also that we point out that any pieces of gun legislation that comes in, that we don't also go through and we don't target individuals um, who may have behavioral health um, concerns or may have ever had some because I think that we've got to make sure that we don't go through and we're not uh, being discriminatory in that way in any way but I do think that to go through and some of the no-brainer things that allows you know uh, weapons that are going to be out in the general public they would go through it and not use for sport not use for recreational leisure um, opportunities of firearm but are actually used to do tremendous harm those kind of things that we need to have a serious and honest discussion because we don't want to have another damning we don't want to have another Roswell, but I take it a step further beyond the guns and beyond what happened in the schools is because I talked to you a little bit earlier about the budgets and I talked to you a little bit earlier about getting those dollars into the classroom. When you have those dollars go into the classroom or to the students, you're seeing more services for the mental health side of it. You're seeing more for the counseling side. Right. You're seeing more in school in, in, in school based health clinics. Those things are all part of the educational and the community perspective that we need to go forward with. And so when we want to have a discussion about what's taking place and the impact that it has, we need to be at the forefront and be proactive on that, not be re reactive and bring in the counselors after the fact. We need to make sure that people are there to provide those services for those students or any anybody else, like on the behavioral health side of it, that we can be proactive and catch these type of incidences before they occur in any type of way. 
we know we're in a drought situation in New Mexico, and I want to sort of wrap up our, our conversation with this a little bit. Um, uh, we know that we have, uh, many efforts have been made since New Mexico lost a lawsuit to Texas over over the Rio Grande and, and um, to try and make a state water plan. Um, so I'd like to ask you, one, why this is proceeding so slowly, um, what a state like ours actually has to do in order to be uh, uh, sustainable in a drought like this. And last, I'd love, I'd love to get your, your insight into, uh, into the Gila and into the possibility of damming uh, that wild river. As a chair of the Economic and Rural Development Committee, you know, I've had opportunity to see how we can go through and create the jobs and create the economic um, component that will really assist our state. Um, obviously, our infrastructure is going to be key, whether it's transportation, whether it's broadband, whether it's roads or, or water. Those things are all need to be part of the discussion. And so it has been a concern that there really hasn't been the plans that have come out. Um, I believe that the administration has really lagged behind in trying to bring these forward. Um, and so you see now, uh, you know, an attempt to try to have $212 million or $112 million be appropriated for water projects, but there's no plan behind it. Much like in other areas, if you don't have a plan behind it, it may sound good on the headlines, it may sound good on the surface, and when we get beneath it, we need to make sure that we have those that work for this, those plans that work for the state of New Mexico. So we are dealing with the water issue, and we are concerned about that. It's important that we go through, and we're talking about the water, that we also learn what's happened in the past. You talked about the litigation there and, and with, with uh, Texas. That is a concern. Uh, you know, you see what has happened on the Pecos and the concerns yeah. that have taken place there. So we need to make sure that we bring all these uh, discussions into the forefront and to be able to see what we need to do. We are a diverse uh, state. We are a state that is agriculture. We are a state that deals with, with uh, farming. And we want to make sure that we can we protect that cultural component of our state. And at the same time, have the balance as we continue to grow. We want to make sure we don't shift over so much in one area that we bring in industry or we do so much that it's going to take up a huge water supply. And yet we go through and forget about the agric agricultural needs and those small farmers within our state because they definitely depend on that so those are things that as we go forward and have the discussions I'm excited to be able to bring some plans forward to be able to share uh, what we can do to help uh, really address these water issues head-on you also mentioned about the Gila you know that's right in my, my backyard and you know I grew up uh, playing on the Gila seeing at the times when it was high and when there was a, a low runoffs but you know when we're talking about what takes place and what needs to be done just today I, I signed on and co-sponsored a bill with Senator Peter Worth that would make sure that would go through and have the um, Interstate Stream Commission have some some uh, data and some information to be able to show how we would go through and pay if there was a diversion that take place we want to make sure that we're not creating a diversion and and create so much more um, of a tax burden on the users or on the public we've got to make sure that they can justify how that's going to actually how the monies are going to actually be uh, be uh, appropriated or how they're going to be able to address that so those are things that we see so my, my position has been that we need it it really is a no-brainer it's more of a, of a financial impact as well as an ecological side of it because when you go through and you start to to dam and, and change up the, the ecology of what it is that is, is naturally there then you're going to start to see many more issues that are, we're going to come up against. So my, my position has been that we need to continue to con make it a free-flowing river, that we need to make sure that we don't go through and divert it where we're sending water to other areas, um, and at the same time having to turn back and pay Arizona for the use of our water. So those are things that pretty much is, is a no-brainer. Um, and so the legislation that we put forward today will give you know both sides the opportunity to be able to justify how it is and why it is that things should be done the way they're saying. I'm pretty confident that there's not going to be a justification to show how those dollars can be used unless it's going to be a huge tax burden or a huge cost burden on the on the people of the state of New Mexico. Well, I've learned a whole lot today. I've, I've really appreciated it. Uh, you've, you have a, a way of getting into some complications that are, uh, that are really not talked a lot about. And I'm, I'm very grateful that you were here with us today in the Mercury Library. Thanks so much. I wish you well.
I want to thank you too because it gives the opportunity to be able to share what has actually been taking place on, on state government, to be able to share how we can bring forward a new energy, a new opportunity to be able to take the state forward in a way that we may have not seen before. Um, I'm excited about that opportunity, but in order to be able to move us forward, it's important that we understand where we've been and where we're at. I think that by sharing in our discussion, we're able to share the in-depth knowledge um, for whatever reason that I've, I've been able to live it the last six years and to be able to see the issues affecting the people of the state of New Mexico and opportunities and discussions like this help me share those those discussions and those uh, experiences and to be able to share what we can do going forward.